Um, okay, so we're continuing through our uh, God at War series, our, our kind of look at spiritual warfare, um, and we've moved meticulously through Scripture um, and taken uh, looks at uh, how, where demons and where Satan comes into play, and, uh, but we haven't really focused solely on them because one of the things that we have really made a huge point of is this is God's story. This is not Satan's story. This is not demon's story. This is not angel's story. This is God's story. Um, and we've walked through a lot. It was funny. Uh, did anybody hear some similarities in Jeremy's lesson on Sunday with what we've been talking about in here? Um, if you've been paying attention, you would have heard some similarities. So, tossing this out there, that's because I gave him the chapter on John chapter 9 out of the God at War book. That's, that's, so that's why it was so correlated in, in a lot of really neat ways. Um, and, he, uh, uh, and it's one of the reasons we specifically didn't cover that story in here, because I knew that he was going to want to uh, preach on that and hit on that uh, and, and everything. So I thought he covered that wonderfully. John 9, you know, the story of the, the man born blind and and he went into the Greek. I was just very glad that he did all that. Uh, and I, like him, also think that it's really funny that we just dust past the fact that Jesus spit to make the mud. Um, and I noticed in the text that the guy didn't say Jesus spit and made the mud with mud when he was telling the synagogue, the, the Pharisees. He was just saying he made mud. And you know his friends behind him were cringing. So, uh, man, I was just complimenting your sermon on Sunday. Um, you can pay me later. Uh, yeah. So, um, we've moved through the Old Testament, then we got into the New Testament, we looked at the Gospel. And the thing that we remember is we are not looking at new doctrine or the doctrine. I'm not trying to change any viewpoints that you may have had about Jesus' ministry and His healings. I'm just giving you a different perspective to look at it. So Jesus shows up, and when He starts pronouncing His kingdom, it is in direct contrast to Satan's kingdom. And we've never really wrapped our minds around that, but Jesus specifically says, a kingdom divided against itself can't stand, and I, interestingly enough, we love that quote, he's using it about Satan's kingdom, because they were accusing him of being a part of it, because he was casting out demons. So there is a unified kingdom. There is a, a, a diabolical, illegitimate ruler over the earth. We looked at all of the verses that call Satan the ruler of this earth, the kingdom, the, the, the ruler of the kingdom of the, uh, of the air, the God of this age, lower G. Sometimes those phrases, when you just, if, you, if I was to just say that and you've not been sitting in this class, I see how that could like make you clinch up and you're like, no, Jesus is Lord. Well, yes, but he was fighting against an illegitimate Lord. And that's where this brokenness and darkness and futility and sin, these are parts of this other kingdom, this dark kingdom. And Jesus' ministry from his healing to his preaching was this authority saying, no, it's time for us to be restored to our created purpose as being vice regents of God, of being people that reveal the character of God. And then in what might have been one of the craziest moves ever, he said, and I'm going to reveal that to the world through the church, through the body of Christ, Ephesians 3.10. I'm going to reveal, I'm going I'm I'm to show my wisdom through the unity of the church, through the love of the church, through the body of Christ being transformed into the likeness of my son. Which means, that the world is supposed to see churches and gasp at how unified and loving they are, which in and of itself is a challenge because do they see that? So that's part of this purpose. Now, we looked a lot last week at the actual part of the gospel, which was the death of Christ, and how we couldn't do any of this ourselves because we were, sin we, 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 were, we, were, we were defined by our sin. We were separated from God, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then, of course, we talked about how the wages of sin were death. And so then we looked at Jesus' cross as Christus Victor, the victory of Christ. Jesus reconciling us with Jesus. 
pulling us out of the dark. Look at, um, go to Colossians chapter 1. I'm going to take a picture of this so I can write some verses, but this is a verse I didn't get to read. Look at verse 13. Chapter 1, verse 13. For he, he being Jesus, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness. And he has brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. So the gospel is saving you by pulling you out of this dominion of darkness, pulling you out of this brokenness, pulling you out of this world of sin and restoring you. And so we looked at baptism last week. We looked at the beauty of it. I want to read it again. Baptism connects the believer with the death and resurrection of Christ. So in baptisms, therefore, believers express and participate in God's cosmic victory. And so baptism does have that personal dynamic of I am saved, but it also has a universal, history-spanning, cosmic moment where we are now reunited in the resurrection of Jesus so we can begin living li a life that looks like him. You know, and, I, and we talked a little last week about how I, I, I'm genuinely convinced that if we taught baptism the right way, we couldn't stop people from getting in the water. Because it's not about should I, should I, should I. It's about I want to be a part of this because I'm in this kingdom of darkness and I'm in this dominion of darkness and I want to do what Jesus did. I want to die with him and be resurrected. Jesus' cross, death on the cross, allows that to happen. And we looked at, and, and so we looked at Colossians 2 where it says that our sins were nailed to the cross and God made a public spectacle of the enemy in Colossians 2. We looked at uh, 2 Corinthians 5 where it says God made him who had no sin to be sin so that we could become the righteousness of God. Man, I, and you know, that, that victory, that gospel story, it's empowering. And if you can hear that and be confident and comfortable just sitting in a pew on Sunday morning, I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you in the war that we are in. So tonight, what are we, we're going to look at tonight, we're going to walk through kind of the epistles, um, the letters, and what we're going to see is even though Jesus has won, he has struck the decisive blow. Satan is trying to take as many down as he can. It's an already not yet situation. So we're going to look at how Satan is still, was still very active in the New Testament, uh, was still something that Paul and Peter and James and John and the guys that wrote very specifically continued to say, hey, your work is to fight against the powers of darkness. The things you do, you know, we talk, and, and, and when we look at Acts chapter 2 and Acts chapter 4, the church had, they had everything in common and everything in direct contrast to the kingdom of Satan. When we looked at the way that he called them to radical love, you know, we talked, we've talked a little bit about Galatians 5, where you have the fruit of the Spirit that pours out of you. Well, a few verses before are the list of sins. Sin is basically you saying that God doesn't have it right. That's what sin is. Sin is you saying that my way of doing things is better than God's way. The status quo way of doing things is more comfortable and is better. That's what, that's what sin is because it's separating us from that true purpose. So what we do, as I've said so many, so many times, what we do matters in the name of Jesus. The way that we love people, the way that we worship, Goodness gracious, the way that we pray. We're going to talk a little bit about prayer, and we'll probably move into prayer next week as well. Um, I, can, I can throw this out there. If you... I've been reading this book by Francis Chan called Letters to the Church. Chan has a tendency to overstate things. He says some things very well. He does overstate things. But if there's one thing that he is, he's very bold. And here's why I'm giving you that commercial. If I slip into some language that's too mean, that's my bad. That's the, that's the content that I'm reading. But here's, here's my challenge for you. 
If your prayer life right now is nothing but a prayer before a meal and a small prayer before you go to bed, you are not fighting the war as God intended for you to fight it. Pray. Paul, when Paul says pray without ceasing, again, this is not the way to look at it, but it is a way to look at it. Take the, take the um, is that the alarm? Am I going in the wrong direction? Um, take, take, yeah, that's, that was it. Talking about prayer. Uh, take this warfare mindset that we've talked about for six weeks now, and then take the verse, pray without ceasing. Think about that. Think about it. Think about this warfare situation that we've laid out, that everything you do in the name of Jesus matters as an act of war, and then read Paul's verse, pray without ceasing. And all of a sudden, oh my goodness, I probably need to pray without ceasing, right? And all prayer verses, go to Philippians 4, and all things, uh, with, 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 bring your petitions to God with thanksgiving, in, in Philippians 4, you know, pray to him. Uh, that think, about, think about other verses on prayer. Um, uh, we're going to look at Ephesians 6 where it goes through the, the armor of God and then it says, and in all things, pray for the saints. Uh, Chan said in his book, I thought this, was, this is one of those ones that kind of, it kind of shakes you, but he said when he worked on the staff at a church that he expected all of his staff members to spend one hour in prayer because he said, I don't need you running around like chickens with your head cut off trying to get all your ministries in line if you're not praying over it. And I'm telling you that, it challenged me reading that. Um, a few years ago, I heard this guy speak, and it was really brilliant how he did this. He was speaking to a room full of ministers, which is already challenging because ministers, if you haven't figured it out, know everything. Um, and so it's really hard to stand in a room of ministers and teach them. And what he did, I thought, was so smart. He said, I can plan a good sermon. I can plan good ministries. I can plan good events. And I can do all of that without praying or asking the Spirit to guide me. I have the ability to do that. But all those things will mean nothing if I don't pray and let the Spirit move that. And let me say, that, that challenged me in a big way because I, I can organize things very well. I can do things very well. And to my shame, I have pulled things off before that people have been like, that was really good. And then I've gone home and been like, I didn't pray over that one time. And that's, I need the Spirit to guide that. Because then I start thinking, man, how much more can God do it if we were to pray and let the Spirit get into it, you know? So maybe that verse on quenching the Spirit isn't so much, you know, it's more about, hey, if you're not praying, you're kind of automatically quenching the Spirit. So pray. Pray without ceasing. Um, man, see, I, I got off my notes already. I haven't even started. Uh, so, um, real quick, Christ's cosmic victory as redemption. We hear this word redemption. Um, when that word redemption is used in Scripture, the technical term in the ancient world was for the purchase of a slave. It was a price of release. That's, that's what it was. So when we are redeemed, we are saying that we were Slaves And what were we slaves to? Sin and death. That's Romans 6. Uh, and it, Romans 6 actually says you are a slave to what you worship, which is a pretty fascinating take because I, 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 N.T. Wright says, uh, says it famously, um, you are what you worship or you become what you worship, which is a very similar verse we're going to look at tonight to where your treasure is, there your heart is, uh, where your focus is. Um, I'm going to take a picture of these real quick so I can write verses on the board um, so we can take a look at that. So God's cosmic victory has redeemed us. I read that out of Colossians 1. We're no longer in the kingdom of darkness. We've moved through Scripture in a way that kind of blows open the doors of our idea of what church is. So I never want to downplay our times of worship on Sunday morning. Man, they are beautiful and they are wonderful, but they, will, they were never intended to be the end game. They were never intended to, to be the be-all. They were intended to be moments of mutual encouragement, of fellowship and community, of mutual worship and, and praise together. Uh, from the very beginning, God loved to have his people come together. Um, you know, and I mean, think, when you move through Scripture, you see how much we've actually turned that, we've, we've turned it very anemic. 
if you move through Scripture, I'm always blown away at the fact that the celebration with Ezra when they got back, you know, Ezra and Nehemiah, that was like a seven-plus day celebration. That never stopped. Um, and, and then when you, when you get into the New Testament and you look at the way they were together, it literally, they lived life together. At our core, we call Gateway a family, but we, do, we still have a very come-and-go sort of idea. So there's a challenge there. I'm not, I don't know how we can fix that. I, I, I mean, but just something for us to think about when we start thinking about, um, when we start thinking about ways as the church that we are supposed to push back against the, the kingdom. So we are set free from sin and guilt. We are set free from the law, which is the way of acquiring righteousness before God by our acts, by our deeds. We... A lot of us in here know this. This is the gospel. This is all the things that, that we've been set free from. The slavery, as we have seen, is from the devil, the darkness, futility. Now, some people have taken umbrage with the, we, God ransomed his son for us as if saying, well, why did God need to, you know, buy Satan off, right? And, and they try to cheapen some of that language, and I love what it says here. The, the thrust of Scripture when it comes to these redemption Scriptures says this much. Christ was willing to do whatever it took to pay whatever price was necessary in order to defeat the tyrant who had enslaved us and thereby sets us free. And so what it took, the New Testament teaches us, is nothing less than the Son of God becoming a man and dying a hellish death upon the cross. So in some mysterious way, this event disarmed, drove up, tied up, and condemned and destroyed the God of this age who held us in slavery. It thereby enthroned the Son of God as the rightful king of his Father's universe, which is where he was eternally destined to be. And it therefore spelled freedom, liberation, redemption, and complete salvation for all previously enslaved subjects who are willing to receive it. Indeed, it shall ultimately establish us as lords over the earth, as we were always meant to be, little L lords. So the cross is about us, and the cross is about overcoming evil. When we turn evil into an equation to figure out and to say, this should never happen to us, we're good people, does, why, why do bad things happen to good people? And then we panic when it does occur to us, we miss out that evil will happen, but it has been overcome. And one of the things we're going to look at that Paul and Jesus made very clear is, is when you have accepted this, you can almost guarantee that evil is going to happen to you. Which always gets us. Because we think, why do bad things happen to good people? Well, the answer is in Scripture. Because you're a good person. And evil wants to break you. Evil wants to separate you. Evil wants you back. We talked about it last week. That God took the foolishness of the cross to defeat the wise. So he took the former slaves of the enemy to reveal his victory. And so when we wrap our minds around that, all of a sudden we walk out of here thinking, well, evil could happen to me, and we need to think about that. So yes, we pray for protection. Absolutely. Absolutely. And we bind ourselves together. And we hold on. One of the things we're going to look at, we, one of the most important scripture in, uh, in one of the most important bits of verses is the end of Romans chapter 8, where it says nothing can separate us from the love of God. Y'all, that's the eternal hope. Evil will happen to you. You will be broken. You will be hurt. You will suffer. But if you continue to keep your face towards God, he has said that nothing that happens to you will separate me from you. That's the beautiful hope. That's, that's the truth of the matter. When we first started this series, I told a story about a little girl named Zosia. She was a little Jewish girl, and it was during World... World WW2. <laughs> Sorry. I'm, um, it was, so it was during this time period, and so the Nazis infiltrated her village. And this is a very, very hard story. And when they saw this beautiful little Jewish girl, one of the Nazi soldier, soldiers said... No, no Jew should have eyes that pretty. They're like diamonds. And he cut them out of her head. Mom watched it, went crazy, died. Of course, what do you do with a, a blind little Jewish child? You, she's no good now. The reason I told that story at the very beginning of this series, which it looks like a lot of y'all weren't in there for that, so 
But the reason is because I didn't want us to think of evil in abstract. You understand what I'm saying? I, I wanted us to think of evil as real. I wanted us to think of evil as child slavery, sex trafficking, murder, and rape. I wanted us to think of it as abuse and addiction. Things that, again, I've, I've, I've probably, we've had a lot of new people come in. I, I warned that there would be triggers in this class. There would be things we're going to talk about that are real because we need to talk about them. Because for too long, the church, we've made evil abstract. And we've made evil headlines. And we've made it to where we can wake up in the morning and, God forgive us, see an article that says hundreds of people die on the other side of the world and scroll past it to watch the really cool recipe on the Internet. Because we're detached from that. that. And that, that's a really real situation that we have. That's part of, if you're in the screw tape letters class, commercial, that's part of, this, of Satan, of evil, callousing you to real evil. And so then what happens is, is we use that as the weapon to say, well, I'm not that bad. I'm, not, I'm, I'm going to church on Sunday. I'm not murdering people. I'm not doing that. Well, then we begin to get challenged by the fact that Scripture says, no, no, don't let the sun go down on your anger or you will give the devil a foothold. Y'all ever, ever wrap your minds around that one? That verse literally means you're going to give the devil a room in your heart when you let the sun go down on your anger. Think about that one. That's another one of those verses that we use a lot and we don't even know that Satan was involved with it. Y'all remember two weeks ago, the verse about our integrity? Let your yes be yes. Let your no be no. Anything else comes from the evil one. And we were all like, wait a second. Satan's involved in this situation? Yes, your integrity matters in the spiritual war. So think about this first. We'll, we'll look at, the, where's, does anybody know where it is off the top of their head? I've got it written down right here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, 26 and 27. Starting in 26. Actually, let's go to 25. I mean, let's read all this. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. He who is stealing must steal no longer. He must work and do something useful with his hands so he may have something to share with those in need. Do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. So, all right, well, I just threw your, well, I'm not a murderer out there because I think all of us might be guilty of some unwholesome talk sometimes. And it's in the context of this same verse that says when you let this unwholesome talk and when you let this anger breed and you go to bed with this anger that has caused you to sin, you are literally opening up a room in your heart for Satan. And so, I challenge you. I challenge you when it comes to evil, when it comes to sin, when it comes to these sort of things, push back against those things. This is what Paul was laying out. Paul was saying, look, everything about your life now, when you have chosen to follow Jesus and you've chosen to be baptized and you are now resurrected in Him, you are now part of a war. Now you get to celebrate the victory of Jesus, but don't for one second think that it's going to stop. And we, of course, saw this in the first century. We saw, we hear about brothers and sisters dying. We hear about all that. And then that still exists in our world now. But the challenge I have for us here in our very comfortable American area is, is a lot of times we don't have that tension and therefore we don't feel the intensity of being a follower of Jesus. We've allowed it to turn us into complacent Christians that feel comfortable saying, well, I pray occasionally and I do this. And the thing is, is remember, we've already established the fact that we don't do this because it saves us. We do it because we are saved. We don't wake up in the morning and say, God, I hope you love me today. We wake up in the morning and say, God, you love me and I'm going to live out of that. So I want to make that clear. So if you think that this sort of talk moves to like this new legalism, sort of like this, no, I know, your salvation has happened. Jesus has covered your salvation. When you turn your face to him and when you die to him and you come out of the waters, you, you have that salvation. Now you live out of that love. 
When I made my commitment to Jessica in marriage, I didn't say, I do, and then stop working towards it. Right? No, I didn't. (laughs) (laughs) So a verbal commitment that I am now dedicating the rest of my life to fulfill my vows. Right? We don't quit because the marriage ceremony is over. We don't say, I didn't have the marriage ceremony and say, okay, I'm going to hang out with you for an hour and a half a week, maybe on Wednesday nights if I'm not busy. I, I, and again, I'm, I'm being playful here, and, I, and I'm not trying to, I'm really not trying to shame anyone. Y'all know me well enough to know I don't deal in shame. I don't, I don't deal in shame. But the point is, is, is I would be a horrible husband if I made the commitment, but then did not live out of the commitment. That's, 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 that's going to Jesus. That's coming out of the waters. That's coming out of the waters and saying the commitment's there. The salvation, we are married. The, the, the signatures are on the paper, but that doesn't mean anything. And now here we are 13 years after that point and 20 and 30 and 50 and 60 years after the point, we're going to be living the same commitment. That's how we are as Christians. Think about this in the spiritual warfare motif we've been talking about. We all have a mental picture of demon possession. Right? Okay, it's in Scripture. And then, of course, Hollywood has, has accentuated aspects of it. But honestly, if you read Scripture and you've watched some of those movies, I don't watch them, they scare me. Um, you watch some of those movies, I mean, it's not like it's necessarily different. Uh, and some of you might even have instances where you felt like you've dealt with something that resembles some sort of possession. So we have this mental image of being possessed by a demon. You know, and let's do it. Eyes rolled back, you know, foaming at the mouth going crazy, freaking people out in the general vicinity. We are indwelled by the Holy Spirit. How do you picture Christians? So we have this really over-the-top... Now, here's what I'm talking about. Here's what I'm talking about. Jesus, God said, I'm going to use the body of Christ to reveal my wisdom to everyone. Demon-possessed people look and act like this. How do we look and act as possessed people with the Spirit? Now, I remember when I read that juxtaposition, it took me a second to get there because, of course, my, my, my very um, temporal mind says, well, I'm not going to rip my clothes off and dance around like a crazy person. I mean, oh, I almost cracked a joke there. I, I dialed it back, though. Okay. <laughs> All right, yeah, sorry. Okay, um, but do I live radically in love with people? Do I encounter people in my public life where they know that there's something different about me? Does my integrity drive my vocation? For those of you that work in, 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 in other areas. When people see you, do you change the atmosphere of the room because you're a kind, joyful person? Or do they see you as bitter? Do they see you as angry? Again, just wrap your mind around the idea that we have a very vivid picture of demon-possessed people. What is your vivid picture of Holy Spirit-indwelled people? Boy, that's, now that's spiritual warfare we've never really covered, but it makes, think about it. We wrap our minds around that and we begin to say, okay, so how do I look like this person? Um, so, let's, I mean, let's, let's talk about a couple of areas in which that happens. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Before we get there, put a pin in that. I want you to look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. It's a story that we were not taught as children. Y'all know, you know, I've, I've been pulling some of those stories out. Those, um, goodness, I've forgot. Let's go. I want you to, if, if, you, if, you, if you got to 2 Corinthians 10, put your marker on it. If you didn't get there, don't worry about it. Just right now, I want you at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay. I open this class up with a story out of Daniel 10, where Daniel prays, 
right? Daniel prays, doesn't hear anything for 21 days. Angel shows up, said, man, I heard your prayer. God heard your prayer. As soon as you prayed it, I came with an answer. But the prince of Persia stopped me. A demonic prince over a nation stopped the answer to a prayer reaching Daniel and Michael the archangel had to bust up in there and let him go. Okay? Again, it's one of those stories that, like, whoa, what? We looked at a story where God said the Israelites were going to beat the Amalekites, but then the king sacrificed his firstborn son to Chemosh, and the rage was such that Israel retreated. So we've looked, again, we don't tell these stories. Now, this is one of those stories we also miss. This is post-resurrection. Listen to this. Re- hear this literally. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 17. But brothers, when we were torn away from you for a short time, in person, not in thought, out of our intense longing, we made every effort to see you. For we wanted to come and see you. Certainly I, Paul, did again and again, but Satan stopped us. Anybody know when we talk about Paul and the the missionary journeys that he apparently really wanted to go to Thessalonica, but Satan stopped him. And you might be like, how? I don't know. All I know is that obstruction from Satan was real to Paul. So now, when we read Paul, when we read the verse that we're about to read in 2 Corinthians, when we read Ephesians 6, when we look at all these verses where Satan is mentioned, know that Paul is not treating Satan as some abstract idea. Okay? Paul is not thinking about Satan as a, well, you know, everything happens for a reason, guys. <laughs> no, he's saying Satan is trying to mess this up. And we've got to keep going. We've got to pray against them. We've got to love people. We've got to take care of the poor. We've got to help the oppressed. We've got to free the slaves. We've got to do these things that Jesus did because that's how we fight against evil, which is not abstract. Satan stopped him from going to Thessalonica. He wanted to go. And you would think that Paul would, should be able to, right? I mean, he's Paul. But there was obstruction there. Um, here's the bonus. Where did the thorn in Paul's flesh come from? Satan. Satan. And God even said about that one, no, you're going to learn from this. You're going to feel my strength in the midst of your weakness. People argue all the time what the thorn is. I think we purposely don't know because we all have thorns. That's why. Actually, if you want my honest opinion, it's not. But I think, I, I think a lot of it had to do, that a lot of people say it was poor eyesight. Like he really couldn't see. That's, that's something. And I relate to that one because I am legally blind. I'm wearing contacts. Um, so I'm like, yeah, that was it. Um, but that's one thing they say. There's, there's a myriad of things. It's not worth going down the journey. The journey is Satan, something, something that afflicted Paul, that messed with him, a thorn in the flesh, a constant companion was actually given to him, not by God, but by Satan. But then God said, I can still use it. And that's, the, that's what Romans 8.28 is. For God works all things for good for those who love him and call it according to his purpose. It doesn't say for God caused all things for good. It says God works all things for good. So a lot of us start thinking about that. That even when we are under attack, that's how we can take cancer diagnosis. That's how we can take that stuff and still see God's glory in it. Not because God's hand caused it, but because God can still be redeemed in it. So, Paul did not see Satan as some abstract idea. He did not see evil or things that obstructed him as coming from a mysterious everything happens for a reason plan. He saw it as absolute obstruction from Satan, and so he said, okay, so here's how we're going to combat this, and here's where we'll spend our last 15 minutes. So let's go um, to two major areas in which there is a battlefield going on in your lives right now. Number one, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 5. When I was growing up, this verse was normally taught about uh, sex for young men. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I get it. This is, in case you're wondering, this is to capture every thought and take it captive. The first time I heard this preached a thousand times as a teen was young men 
capture the thoughts of lust. It was all, and, and, and I think that there's a motif there that works, but it's definitely a bigger picture here. So let's read this first, starting in verse 3. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Now, let's break this down. First and foremost, the, the a number one battlefield for you right now is in your mind. This is one of the reasons, again, another commercial. Screw tape letters paints this picture so brilliantly that a lot of times we walk around and we're like, I'm not murdering anybody, I'm not having an affair, I'm not doing this, but our minds are so void of a relationship with God that we don't have control over them. And so Paul says, hey, one of the main battlegrounds is going to be in your mind. One of the main places that Satan, and, I don't, I, and some would say, well, does that mean that Satan can possess your brain? Can he read your thoughts? I'm not even interested in going into that because I don't think that's important because I think our minds are jacked up enough as it is. That's why we need to take them captive and make them obedient to Christ. But look at what it says. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. We have established for seven weeks what is against God. Satan, the powers that be, sin, things that separate us from his presence. And Paul says you have to take captive. Listen, look at the, look at the war language he's using. We don't wage war as the world does. We wage it in a different way. Take captive those thoughts. So that means the thoughts you think affect the spiritual war that's happening around you. Your mind. Romans 12. What does it say? Transform your... Or be renewed by the transformation of your mind. And so a lot of times... We, this is what going through the motions was. If you were in any of my Sabbath classes, you heard this till I was blue in the face. God is not interested in your vain, empty worship. He's interested in where your heart and where your mind are focused. And so we walk through. Let's start walking through the things that happen in our mind. Unforgiveness. Harboring bitterness. Harboring anger. Harboring division. Harboring complaints. Those things seem to create strongholds inside of you that resist the knowledge of God. That's why taking captive demolishes the strongholds. You see that? When you let your mind stay in that area, you are creating, just like it says, rooms in your heart, rooms in your mind for Satan. And the reason that a lot of us, I think, don't really apply a lot of this is we don't want to go that far. We don't want to think about our apathy or complacency actually being anti-God and therefore pro-Satan. We don't like that language because you're like, are you calling us a bunch of Satan worshipers? That's, that's, your mind starts going there. You're like, well, Seth, I understand that you know, I, I don't do this, but I wouldn't call myself you know, a servant of Satan. That's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying that it can begin to build up strongholds that you don't even know or realize that you're now living in apathy and complacency. Again, screw tape letters, that's what he says. Make it so subtle they don't even realize that all these strongholds are built up in their minds. And this is big. And this is also means that, that how do we do this? We, we have to begin to train our minds to think. You know, I've, this is how I did it with teens. If a teen is interested in something in band or in dance or in sports, they practice. Do you ever practice the spiritual disciplines. And what I mean by that is, do you practice praying so you can get better at it? A lot of us say, man, my prayer life stinks. Well, because we don't pray enough to get it good. Uh, you know? Or a lot of say, well, I don't, I don't um, you know, this is, you, you train your mind. One of the things that I do, and this is not pessimistic, this is warfare. I wake up in the morning and think, things could go very wrong today. I could be interrupted today. God, 
Can you help reveal where you need to be glorified in that moment? And when it happens, guess what? I'm not surprised. I'm not surprised. I'm not blown away, oh my goodness, that I was interrupted. I'm not blown away. And y'all think it's not a perfect system because sometimes I still do get aggravated and I've got to fight that. I've got to fight that. I've got aspects of my own personality. I've made it very clear. I could, like, never see another human again, I mean, short of my wife, and I'd probably be fine. I, I, I have this, I, I, even though I'm loud and in your face, I'm actually a very introverted person. I've got to fight that. I can't use that as an excuse. I can't use that as an excuse. Now, I'm not saying I need to be stupid because then it goes in the other direction because when an introvert is done being around people and they have to keep being around people, they're mean. Um, but, so again, you have to capture your thoughts. That's what I'm saying. It's a constant thing. It's constantly putting your mind in the presence of God. It's, that's why Paul says pray without ceasing. So your mind is constantly, you're constantly capturing thoughts. And you might be like, man, that sounds really exhausting. I think it starts exhausting, but eventually it becomes your nature. We talked about that in the Psalms class. When it says, hide the word in your heart, let your word be a lamp. Enough of this Christianity is, you know, I told them that I wanted to be, I was going to tell them my mind, but I'm a Christian, so I'm not going to do that. No, make your first reaction be love. Not the anger that you feel that you have to overcome because you're a Christian. Does that make sense? But if we think like that, that's what happens. Christianity is never meant to be second nature. It's meant to be first nature. It's meant to be your nature. And so when things go wrong or things go bad, our first reaction is to be love. And when things go wrong that are outside of our control, the futility of cancer or the futility of of loss or, or, or divorce or brokenness, you know, we, as a body of Christ, you have thus fostered a relationship where people can immediately offer you healing. So you don't actually have to be strong because everyone will be strong with you. That's the unity part of the body of Christ. I've said it multiple times. There's many a Sundays that I won't sing a word because I just can't, but I still want to be around those that can, and I'm just going to piggyback on your faith for a little while. That's a way of taking capture of these thoughts. So that's a a task that I want to give you guys. I want you to wake up tomorrow, Thursday mornings. Like I said last week, I'm making your Thursdays really hard. I want you to wake up tomorrow morning, and I want you to take capture your thoughts. I want you to say no strongholds. I'm not going to let Satan get in there. I'm not going to let him. And then pray that God reveals strongholds that are built up in you that you didn't even know were there. That's a big one. Pray that God reveals some pretensions and arguments against his knowledge that are already festered inside of you. And say, God, reveal these to me. Or have something happen, an interaction or something, where somebody reveals that. Look, I I pick a lot on my relationship with Jeremy, but Jeremy and I have a relationship that we will throw daggers of love at each other to make sure that we are being challenged to not grow complacent. Jeremy will ask me how my heart is. He will ask me if I am okay in the standpoint of spiritually, in the standpoint of, of mindset. And I will ask him the same. We, we, will, we will challenge each other to make sure we are. So that way, I might not know. I might have a stronghold I didn't even know I had. Jessica and I, I mean, that's, that's a foundational part of our relationship, is an open communication that does not let Satan build strongholds in ourselves and in our marriage. We talk about everything, everything, and we'll always talk about everything because we're not going to let Satan build a stronghold in our relationship, in our own lives that can create problems. We talk about it. Another area for this last um, is uh, in our hearts. Matthew, in the uh, Sermon on the Mount, I don't have the exact verse. Somebody can help me. I'll get there really quick. Um... Okay, verse 19 of chapter uh, 6. Y'all are familiar with it. It 
Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourself treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. I love how that's backwards a little bit. It's not where your heart is, there your treasure is. It's where your treasure is, there your heart is. So it kind of, it, it, it takes away the, well, let me tweak that a little bit and make it work for me. And this, you've heard this a, a thousand times. Where your energy is, where your focus is, where your money is, where your priorities are, that's where your focus is. Now, I love revealing this truth. You don't have to stop the things that are important to you to make God a priority. You make God a priority in the midst of the things that are important to you. Man, I love telling teenagers, I'm actually not upset that you have a basketball game and you can't go on a retreat. But I want you to be the best Christian on that basketball court that you can. I, I, don't want, you to, I want you to do the things that you would learn how to do if you were on the retreat. Right? And that's the same for us. We come to here on Wednesday night. I want you, if, if you have to miss a Wednesday night because you need to minister to somebody, I would, I would love for you to do that. Because all we're going to talk about here is how y'all need to be ministering to people. Where your focus is and where your priority is. It's not about saying, well, I work too much or I do this. Now, you might have to have that talk with yourself, but maybe the talk is more, okay, God, how can I reveal you in this? How can I show where you are in this situation. That's a, what a beautiful reality that that is. So our hearts, our focus, are our hearts focused on being transformed into the likeness of Christ? When we come, hey, here's the challenge. We're going into a, a we've, we, have, we have closed. We have sold this building. It is, it is happening, okay? Transition period's coming. New building's coming. Some of us are going to get a little bit angry. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Don't let Satan get a foothold. And make sure that your heart is constantly focused on what's most important, and that's making much of the name of Jesus in our communities. Okay, right? So think of now, see, I've messed all y'all up because you were like, I'm going to have some good anger with this. No, this is going to be a battleground right for Satan to get into. Satan sees something like this and I bet he is biting at the chomps because he knows that he can divide people on something big like this. You start messing with people's normalcy. You start messing with their comfort a little bit and they start getting a little antsy. And Satan says, I can work with that. So church, class, Wednesday night people, whatever y'all want to be called, you better start praying. You better start getting your heart focused on saying, you know what, I'm going to transform Jesus in this. I'm going, to, I'm going to be like Jesus in every way that I possibly can in this situation. Because it is war. It is absolute war. Next week we'll look at Ephesians 6, the armor. We'll kind of break that down as acts of, of how we apply those into our lives. Um, I'll read this, and then, and then also hopefully next week uh, we'll get into the final victory of this war. We've had a change of scheduling. So, um, sanctuary was scheduled on April 17th, but because that is my birthday, I said I'm not doing it. Um, I'm, I'm joking, um, but I do expect something special in here. Um, but, so we are not doing sanctuary April 17th, we are doing it April 24th. All right, so we're pushing it one week. So we'll still, so we'll we'll have technically two more classes, two more weeks. And then if y'all remember, so for the month of May, that means I've got two spots left if somebody wanted to teach a class. So come sign up for that. And then in June we'll launch um, we'll launch a new a new series. So next week, armor of the Lord, breaking that down, uh, applying that stuff to our lives. We're going to look at the final victory. Spend a lot of time in Romans chapter eight. Um, if you're, wanting, if you're wanting that feel good, that one-two punch, Romans 8, that's going to be it. Because that's, oh, it's, it's such a beautiful reality as we close out the war. And then we're also in the midst of all that, we're going to talk about um, prayer. And then hopefully in this extra class, April 17th, uh, I'd love if you, 
we'll, we'll have a little bit of discussion. If you have some questions, if I blew past something too fast, or, or, or if you just want to kind of talk about it or, or pray, the classes are recorded if you want to listen to them. But hopefully, um, hopefully, I remember I, I, was, I was thinking today, when I started this study for the first time myself, and I've told you all this, and I'm going to tell it to you one more time, it reignited, well, actually, if I can be honest, it ignited my prayer life because my prayer life was re- really never on fire before that. It, 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 it ignited my prayer life. It changed the way that I viewed um, church wars, you know. A lot of the things that unfortunately have defined our tradition, you know, all denominations or non-denominations have their baggage. This study re- reset all that for me and made me start thinking, Man, I don't have time to waste on that. We've got to get out and be making much of the name of Jesus um, uh, and and finding ways to glorify Him. Uh, so hopefully it's doing that for you. Um, and hopefully, hopefully, if anything, your Thursdays have been changed uh, as you as you wake up the next morning and you're thinking about some of this stuff. All right, we'll say a prayer and I'll let you guys get out of here. God, we love you and we thank you. Uh, for, for the way that, that you saved us. And God, as we see in this scripture, Satan and darkness and evil, man, it is real. There is a dominion of darkness that is, that is constantly at work against you to the point that even Paul was stopped by it. He was obstructed by it in his physical travels and not to mention the thorn in his flesh, Father. And so what we have now, Father, is we understand that, that our minds and our hearts, our very beings, our souls are where a major part of this battle happens. And so, yes, Father, we need to get out there and serve people. We need to get out there and, and, and love people. But, God, I, I want to start right now with each person individually. Do they have strongholds built up in their lives? Do they have rooms, Father, that they have let the sun go down on on anger and sin and bitterness and unforgiveness, Father, where Satan has made uh, 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 a room in their lives. God, I pray that you reveal that. I pray that you show uh, in in a stark, real way, ways that that we have let Satan create these strongholds. And, And I pray that we take captive every thought, Father, that we focus, we find where our treasure is, and we get you in that situation as much as possible, Father. I pray that we do pray. That, that we don't say we pray, Father, but we pray. We pray without ceasing. We, don't, we pray when, when we're walking, Father, when we see people that we know need prayer, when, we, when something flashes into our mind, a situation. We take a few moments, Father, and we pray about it. That we be persistent and just intense and overwhelming in our, pray, in our prayer. And Father, I pray we have again, Father, we have this stark image of what a demon-possessed person looks like, Father. I thank you that Francis Chan was able to give me this analogy, Father. We have this stark impression of demon possession, Father. Let's get a stark impression of a Holy Spirit-indwelled body of Christ and what that looks like, Father. Because you have said it's, it's that church that's going to reveal your wisdom. May we do that through our lives and our actions. We love you so much, Father. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.